Uh, hello. Uh, I think we can start. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. My name is Jing. I'm a Google engineer working in Kubernetes storage lifecycle team. Today, I will talk about uh, resource management in Kubernetes, focusing on local ephemeral storage. Uh, strange thing is uh, the, the word is a little bit shady. Hope you, uh, it don't bother you that much. So this is the agenda. So first, uh, we want to make it clear that right, why it's important for local ephemeral storage resource management, what problems we are trying to solve. And I will give a quick overview of resource management in Kubernetes and the general resource model supported in Kubernetes. And then focus on the storage and how we um, manage the local ephemeral storage at different layers and how we solve the different problems. Uh, at last, give a few directions of our future work. Um, I know today is the last day and almost lunchtime. Uh, I will tr try to make it on time. So in case you have more questions and uh, uh, want further discussions, uh, these are my contacts. So my GitHub idea is a little bit different. Uh, so first, as we now know, uh, Kubernetes is a solution for orchestrating containerized workloads. So when you have application, your workloads, a scheduler will pick a node to run the containers for your applications. Over time, as a user, you might experience something not very pleasant, like suddenly your container just got killed, terminated. Or you notice your service running in a container just getting slower and slower. Or even worse, the whole machine just keep crashing and all your workloads running there just in trouble. So why, what's going on? Uh, keep in mind that resources in cloud environment are shared. Right? Containers are running together, side by side, in the same host, and uh, they compete for the resources. What if a container runs suddenly use a lot of CPU and memory and cause other containers to run very slow and also even get killed because out of memory. Or a container just produce lots of data and uh, generate lots of files and cause out of disk error. So we need to solve these problems with proper resource management. So typically we have uh, different resource management goals to address different aspects. Uh, first the efficient allocation of resource. So we want to allocate just enough resources for applications and so, so that you can have some performance guarantee. And also we don't want to like, allocate too much to waste our money. And same time we want to uh, avoid like overcommit resources because it will cause failures, downtime, and hurt your performance. The second aspect, the second goal is since containers are competing for resources, right, we want to have some isolation among them so that we don't want to have some workload just use up all the resources. And the third aspect is for Kubernetes, right, we have some critical system processes like Kubelet is running as a daemon on each node and it manage all the workloads and those critical system processes also need resources. And to make sure the system stability, we want to have those critical processes also have enough resources. So in Kubernetes, resource by definition is something that can be requested, can be allocated, and can, can be consumed. And typical example of such resource is CPU memory, we call CPU uh, compressible because the CPU can be throttled as needed, but memory cannot. And uh, in Kubernetes, we support a simple resource model to so allow user to specify resource request and limit. So request basically the amount of resources you want to allocate for your application, for your container, and how much you need. And the limit set an upper bound that how much resources you want to, like, can be consumed by your application. And we call those specification as the ZR state because it describes how system should behave, right? How much resources um, you want to allocate and consume. 
and the actual resource usage, we call it actual state. And uh, in Kubernetes, we have control loop to drive the actual state always towards to the desired states as close as possible. And that figure uh, shows for setting request and limit, we allow different values. The reason for that is because in many cases, some workloads are burstable. Right? So most of the time, they only consume certain amount of resources, but occasionally they might have big spike. So we want to allocate um, the resources that this application typically use so to have better utilization of your resource, but we also want to allow it to like kind of burst occasionally. And the actual usage might be different, right? Uh, it can be uh, below the request or can be more than the request, but it should be uh, below the limit always. With this simple resource model, like let's see how we like, allocate resource and isolate resource. So first, uh, each part will set a request and the scheduler will check all the nodes, right, the available capacity, whether it can satisfy the request. And if there are multiple candidate nodes can all satisfy the request, it will rank all the nodes based on the scheduler policy and pick the best one. So we support different scheduler policy, uh, some like more towards to evenly distribute workloads, some more like more towards tightly packed the workloads. And by allocating enough resources as you request, right, we kind of reduce the chance of overcommit resources. But it might still happen. We'll see later in later slides. And also, you can set resource limit to make sure the actual usage under the limit. So the system will keep monitoring the actual usage and take actions if it see any violations. So for CPU, it will throttle the CPU. So the CPU usage will never go above the limit. And for memory, uh, it will kill the container. So the memory uh, will be freed up. And in a pod, as we know, when a container is killed, right, the pod will automatically start a new container. So continue the work. Uh, so, so far, um, we talk about the resource management for CPU memory. How about storage? And in the following slides, we'll talk in more detail about uh, the storage management. So um, for storage, Kubernetes support many different types of storage. Uh, in container, right, uh, you can write, read data, and those data are temporary. So when the container dies and finish, so the data will be um, gone. And those data are typically stored in the local disk. And the problem is uh, the data in one container right, cannot be shared to other containers. Since pods right, consist of a number of containers working together, we need a way to share those uh, data. So uh, we have a volume concept in Kubernetes. So a pod can have different volumes, and each volume mounted to different containers. And container can read write to the volume and share data. So one type of volume uh, we call it empty dir. So this tab volume is also considered as ephemeral because when the pod finish, right, terminated, the data in that empty volume will also be cleaned up. So it has the same life cycle as their pod. Typically, empty volume are used for store some temporary data uh, for caching and for scratch page, or you want to checkpointing a long like, running computation. And uh, this data, when part is finished, right, it's okay to clean them up. There are a few other type of volumes, like secrets, config map. They are basically wrapped around the empty data volume. So they, have, they are all belong to the ephemeral uh, volume. By default, they will be backed up by local storage too. And we also uh, support persistent volume because right, people need to persist their data. So for persistent volume, typically they are uh, backed by dedicated disks. And uh, it could either be remote, like uh, GCPD, AWS, EBS, or 
Uh, recently, we also support dedicated local disk. And there will be a talk in the afternoon by, our, by my colleague, um, Michelle, talking about support local uh, persistent disk. And for such persistent volume, it will have a life cycle totally different from their parts. Right? When the part finish, right, the volume is still there. The data will be persisted. And normally, we use uh, called persistent volume API object to represent it. If a part need to use that persistent data, it need to refer a claim we call it PVC, and PVC binds to one of the PV, and the part can use that persistent volume. So basically, we can see ephemeral storage that are shared between containers, among containers, and empty the volumes. So things resources are shared, we also need some management for that shared resource. And for persistent volume, typically they are dedicated disks, so we don't need to worry about too much. So for local informal storage management, we also want to achieve these uh, different management goals. And I'll talk about in more detail uh, how we achieve it at different layers. So just like CPU and the memory, uh, first we want to support informal storage also as first class resource so that user can uh, specify in the container specification right, how much you want to request, how much you want to limit for informal storage usage. And here we have just an example. This part has two containers. Each one requests different amount of resource and different limits. And for request, the scheduler will check whether the node has enough capacity to schedule the, the container and the pods. And for limit, uh, it's monitoring the actual usage of the container. And if they see it exceed the limit, it will evict the pod. Uh, by eviction, we mean you terminate the pods gracefully so that the empty volume like data or the container data will be all cleaned up. And the disk storage will be freed. Now, considering as a part, right, we just mentioned the part can have like volumes. And besides, we want to constrain like how much resources used by container, we also want to constrain how much resources should be used by the volumes. So we add a field, a size limit to basically gave an upper bound like how much resources can be consumed by this uh, volume. And similarly, if the monitoring like detect the volume usage exceed, so it will evict the part. And by setting the limits for container and also volume, right, we have good isolation among different containers and also the parts. So one thing is right now, uh, we don't support uh, explicitly part level like resource specification, resource requirements. But internally, like in system, actually we uh, calculate the part level resource. It is basically uh, the sum of all, all the containers. So here in this example, we have two containers. So at the part level, the request will be the total like 12 gigabytes and the limit is 14 gigabytes. And the usage for this part will be the total usage for, come from all the containers and also volumes, empty the volumes. And we want to make sure at part level, right, the limit uh, should be uh, enforced. So the reason we also care about part level resources, part level, resource consumption is not simply just aggregation of containers, right? It also has some pod level overhead. In the future, we uh, might want to support like explicitly pod level specification, resource specification. And uh, by setting request limit values, we can also um, classify the pods to different QoS classes. And the first one, if you set your request as the same as your limit, we call them a guaranteed pods. 
So those parts right, guarantee have this much resource and also they should not uh, use more than they request. So those parts will not be killed in case of like resource contention, only if uh, the usage exceeds their limit. And also, as we mentioned, we want to support like burstable uh, workload. So when you request is smaller than the limit, right? Limit is higher. So we call them burstable workload uh, pods. They can use more resources than they request, but they are more likely to be killed compared to guaranteed. And the last one, if you don't specify anything for your pod, we call it best effort. So those pods can fit anywhere. So basically, they can use uh, any available resources. But if you need to evict pods to reduce the contention, then the best effort part will be the first target. So now we covered like container level, pod level resource management. And uh, considering node level, right? Although we have like limit for container and pods, but we might still have issue for uh, node level resource management. So here, I use that uh, as an example. First, based on the capacity, we scheduled three pods. And one is guaranteed, one's burstable, one's best effort. So based on the request, right, they can perfectly fit into that node. Uh, however, right, burstable and best effort pod can use more resources than, than they request. When that happened, we can see definitely the capacity is not sufficient anymore. And we have, have like out of disk problem. To solve this, uh, we have an eviction manager, right? To detect whether there is disk pressure and take actions. And also uh, it allows you to set some like eviction threshold. So it monitors, okay, at node, if the available resource, uh, available disk space is smaller than some amount like one gigabytes, it will start eviction action. Before a big pod, it will try to reclaim a disk resource by deleting some unused images or delete dead pods. If it's still not enough, then uh, we'll try to choose some pod uh, to evict. The order of choosing will be uh, in the order of the QoS we just mentioned. And uh, here for eviction threshold, it can be soft or hard. Hard means you take eviction action immediately when there is a violation. Soft means you allow like a certain period of time for uh, grace period of time. So with uh, the eviction threshold, we seem to like have some protection for node level resource. However, we still have issues. So considering here example, and uh, we have this capacity, and we allocate, we scheduled three parts. All of them are guaranteed parts, right? So we, those parts should not use uh, more than they request. So right now it's perfect fit, but remember we mentioned there are critical system processes running too, and they also need resources. So they will like, uh, compete the same resources like disk space with all the other parts. And when this happened, right, we also have this resource contention issue. And to solve this, we have a concept of allocatable. And um, so basically, it allows system mean to reserve certain amount of resources for these critical system processes. And um, after you reserved that much, so we have allocatable resources, basically the capacity minus those reserved. And for users part, they can only use the allocatable part. And you may wonder like how much I should reserve for my part. And uh, we need to like monitoring the node and check the, the total usage at node level and minus the, the total usage of users part. Then that would be the system overhead. And um, we can roughly estimate that overhead should be proportional to the capacity because the bigger capacity you node have, 
you expect to have more workloads. And the system uh, overhead is roughly like proportional to the workloads. Let's say Kubelet, for example, Kubelet usage will be roughly proportional to the number of paths you scheduled to that node. So after that we have this allocatable resource, you can see uh, the third part, P3, no longer fit, and we can only schedule two parts based on the allocatable resource. And we see that right, for scheduling part, we make sure we have uh, we schedule paths based on the allocatable, and uh, we make sure the system demons will have enough reserved resources. However, again, that scheduling part is based on the request, and pod can always use more than the request. When that happens, right, uh, we don't have enough, like uh, we cannot guarantee the system the process have enough resources. So after pod are scheduled running, we also keep monitoring uh, how much each uh, user's part are consumed. If the total usage will exceed their allocatable part, the eviction manager will also take actions to evict parts. And we mentioned that the eviction picks rank their parts based on the QoS, but the QoS classification is only based on the setting of request and limit, right? whether the request is bigger than limit or not. Uh, it's not very flexible. How about you have some burstable workloads that are very important, right? you don't want to evict them first. So uh, since release 1.8, um, Kubernetes support alpha feature of pod priority. So the priority will indicate how important of your pods compared to others. And uh, the eviction policy right now will incorporate the pod priority too. So first, it will target on a pod that the usage is more than the request, and they will rank their pods based on the priority. If there is, there is a tie, then it further will rank pods based on the difference between their usage and uh, the request. And here we show example how you specify the priority for a pod. So you have a, a priority class API object. And uh, you can have different priority. Here is, in this example, we have high priority. And in the pod spec, you need to give what is your priority class name right, to indicate how important your pod is. Yes? What happened to the containers inside the pod? So the container will also uh, killed. But if your pod is managed by like some other controller like stateful set or deployment replica set, and those controller will start a new pod at a different place to make sure uh, you have a pods always running. But if your pod is not managed by any controller, right, and after eviction, your pod basically will be terminated and there's no work, yeah. What Can. With the, database data? the data. So if you use persistent volume, like I said, so even part is terminated, the data will be still in the volume, and data will, will not be cleaned up. But only the empty drawer volume, that is we call it ephemeral like volume, and the, the data will be cleaned up. And if you have other parts, it will it will can continue to use. Uh, the new pod when it started, it can continue to use those persistent volume. So the data will be still there. You can still access those data. Right. Uh, so yeah, for persistent, basically we are saying you use some dedicated disk, right? It's not shared. So um, basically uh, you can kind of make sure your disk size is enough for, uh, and also we plan to have, we are currently working on some feature like a resize persistent volume. So it can be done like resize this volume on time, Dyna dynamically, yes. There's a, a new feature that like we plan to support. 
Yes. Does this imply that QoS is the last category here in the emission policy? Uh, it's kind of uh, not really. It's kind of mixed. First, uh, it will check whether the usage above request, right? So in that case, we are more targeting on burstable and best effort workloads. For guaranteed, right, it should not, the actual usage should not above the usage. So then you huh? could have a case where a lower priority part has less usage exceeding the request. The high, high priority part gets addicted because its usage goes yes. beyond. Yes, yes, current policy is, yes, it's kind of debatable, uh, yes, but the behavior is like that, yeah. Okay, we covered like resource management at uh, container level, uh, container pod level, node level, and uh, we seem to have provided some uh, allocation and isolation about resources. But for like in cloud, right, often we have different group of people, different teams share resources, and how we can like partition or right, allocate resources among different teams. And in Kubernetes, we have a namespace. And namespace basically allow you to partition resources among different uh, group of people. And uh, so for namespace, it allows to specify resource requirements for each group. There is a, just an example, like you create three different namespaces, and when the pod is created, uh, you specify which namespace this pod belongs to. Right? And if you don't have any, like um, create any namespace, by default, the pod will assign to a default namespace. And how to like uh, specify resource requirement in namespace? We have a quota objects. Uh, so in Kubernetes, you, you probably noticed, right? Everything is API objects. And uh, so uh, if you create a resource quota API object in one specific namespace, you can in the spec specify, okay, how much it is request, how much limit. And uh, that it is um, specified like how much pods in this namespace can request and how much is the limit you want to set for all the pods in this namespace. And uh, when pod is created in this namespace, and the system will check whether it violate uh, the quota assigned for this uh, namespace. <clears throat> so by have this uh, restriction, right, we basically kind of partition the resources uh, among different namespaces. And also, if you have a resource quota in a namespace, then all the parts in that part require to have resource uh, limit and request specified. So to help users to have some default value, we have another API object called limit range. And you can, in this limit range, you specify some default value for informal storage here as an example. And when the pod is created in this namespace, and if you don't specify anything, by default it will apply to those default values. Uh, okay, in summary, uh, we talk about like how we support local ephemeral storage as first class resource, <laughs> and we talk about how we support the management at container pod level, so you can have like a resource allocation and limitation. Node level, right, by, allo by allocatable re concept, we can ensure the system stability. And, and namespace level, right, how we partition the resources among different groups. And for future work, uh, first, so far, we more talk about the disk space allocation, right? And disk IO bandwidth also a resource shared by all the containers. And uh, uh, so it will be uh, very nice to be able to, yes, to allocate resources or have some kind of resource uh, management for disk IO is very challenging, we know, and we are still discussing and whether we can support it and how we can support it. And now since we add this local ephemeral storage uh, resource management, we will extend 
uh, our metric API, so to allow user to like very easy to monitor right, how resources are allocated and how resources are consumed. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to also uh, support the pod level uh, limit, re limit and request setting uh, because it's more convenient for user just consider as pod level. And also, uh, it allows the containers inside of pod to share resources instead of like a fine grain of isolation among each individual container. And uh, so far, when we talk about resource management, we also we only set the the requirement statically, right? Before pod create, you set a value, and when the pod is running, you cannot change that value. But in many cases, the workloads, right, just keep changing over time. The the value you set may not appropriate anymore. Right? Then you will lose the benefit of those resource management, and we should consider right, how we can dynamic uh, manage those resources so we allow you dynamically change those uh, re request setting and based on the application behavior. And uh, also uh, for system processes, right, they consume resources and they might also change over time. Right? With more workloads come in, the system overhead will become bigger. Right? The, the initial setting may not uh, enough good enough so we want to like, uh, based on the system behavior, right, how to dynamically set the uh, reserved resources and allocatable resource. And uh, uh, this work is a teamwork. I want to acknowledge our community's uh, team members and also community uh, contributors. Uh, so um, community is open, right? If anyone interests, uh, you can uh, also contribute. Um, okay, that's about my talk. Uh, any questions? Yes. Given the limitations of metrics and so on, what, what are the best tools to use to optimize your resource allocations now to go in and analyze? I can set some values, but they may be worthless because I don't need them. Yes, yes. So right now, Kubernetes itself does not provide any analytical tool for this purpose. But uh, I think during some talks, I noticed that there are some people like working on some this project to analyze the resource usage and to give you better estimation of your application. Right? And uh, also, we plan to support some dynamic setting. And in this way, use that um, some analytical tool that right? you can uh, better estimate the resource usage. So right now, yeah, Kubernetes itself does not support anything yet. Uh, yes. Okay, you can yeah, go ahead. Uh, are there plans to support several disks? Uh, disks. And, and how does Google discover how many uh, space it has for ephemeral storage? Uh, so right now we only focusing on the, the root file system, right? And uh, basically we only monitor how much available in for the root file system, and uh, we don't consider other disks if you do have that and um, you can kind of have to manage uh, yourself to make sure you have enough capacity. Yeah, it, because in, in the typical setting, right, the local informal storage is backed up by the root file system, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you can go first. So uh, basically, like say we have an example like specify empty door, right? In the pod spec, you directly specify that volume. And uh, by default, those volume are backed by your local uh, disk. And persistent volumes, those are typically remote disks, like uh, in cloud, right? GCPD, AWS, uh, EBS. And uh, we currently also start supporting local disk, but that should be in a separate, dedicated disk. And this, how we like manage the persistent uh, volumes. And it's separate from this uh, local informal storage, yeah. Uh, uh, work on the... Uh, 
like, uh, can you say that again? The, uh, thin provisioning. Uh, thin provisioning. Uh, thin provisioning. Uh, no, right now we don't have any work done for the thing provisioning, I think, yeah. Yeah, plan is to not support that. Uh, plan is to like keep local storage, like consistent local storage as like a uh, extensible thing. Like an amount for in this case, thin provisioning or like static provisioning or like dynamic resizing, like dynamic static provisioning, yeah. for example. Uh, the, the plan is to like it's fine, Jing. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I think the plan is to like keep it completely separate. And so we'll probably see people like building operators for different uh, sets of constraints because there's no one storage solution that people like. So I'm uh, just going to like keep that separate from the system. Uh, I see someone in the back uh, have questions. No, oh, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, uh, so currently, uh, in order to uh, decide when to evict uh, pods for their storage usage, uh, it looks like uh, Kubelet is using DU to measure the storage of uh, like a directory tree for a pod. Yes. Uh, have you guys ever considered using uh, LVM? Like, uh, or project level cores, XFS, or extension core? Can you repeat the question? I don't think his mic was working. Just oh, the oh. recording people. Yeah, it actually is not. Uh, how you? Okay, sorry. Uh, so the question was: uh, instead of using DU to measure the storage usage of a pod or a container, um, have you ever considered using uh, project quotas in XFS or Extension Four? It's out of tree right now. Is it in ex XFS? I thought it was in tree. Ah. Yeah. Uh, for Extension Four, it might be out of tree. Yes. Uh, but Not for twice. XFS, I think yeah. Um, a short answer to that is like, yes, we have been thinking about it for two years. Uh, it took a while for ext4 support to land. Uh, it was in 4.10, I think. Um, and even then, like the, the user space tooling isn't complete yet. Like all the coder tools didn't have complete support. Um, the plan is to have like pod level, like you basically need multiple project IDs uh, for a given pod. So we want to get there. But there's like we want to enable people and like have them do what they can do with the level of tooling that exists today before trying to go towards project quota. But yes, like we do want to get there and get rid of you. How about LVM? Um, well, no, we don't want to go the LVM route because it's like just turtles all the way to the bottom, and uh, we want to like stay as close to a, a standard uh, Linux distribution as much as possible. Yeah, but can choose file system, you can use uh, staff DFS to measure the pressure. So Correct. If we, I agree with you on that. Like, if we had a separate file system, that, that it would be great. But there's also like performance costs with that. Um, yeah. So that, again, right? Like, there's no single storage answer. So um, can uh, ephemeral storage be pluggable? Uh, can you make uh, ephemeral storage, I don't know, driver plugging pluggable, so I can use LVM as someone may implement uh, project quotas? Uh, my short answer to that is file an issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can also use flex volumes, right? Correct, but then you don't get the you don't get the like Jing should correct me if I'm wrong. You don't you don't get all the evictions and like you don't get resource tracking and and limitations with that, right? You don't get this active control loop acting on that. But you do get like hard limits that you can set at the very least. Correct. Yeah. So basically, now it operates at the host level. Yes. So now today it operates at the host level, and it, it's a root a container in a pod level. Uh, Story. Okay, so the, the, the fundamental philosophy so that you, you're not letting this to explore, but uh, you know, persistent volumes is a separate thing, right? right. So, the uh, fundamental uh, the design philosophy is like over provisioning your network for this node, for in general, like so you have storage separate from compute, yeah. um, and you use Scratch only when you absolutely need it, and most of your apps might not need it. You use it for caching or like logging, for example. So, that's the well, that's sense. a general recommendation. 
happens in the data center on the root explorers. Everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, that's the, good, that's the problem that. we want to address, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.